Hello and welcome to the Last Looks podcast, a show where we catch up with talented hairstylists and makeup artists in the film and television industry. We'll pick their super creative brains and find out all the good stuff. Join me, your host, Jamie Lee, in finding out what's what in the hair and makeup departments around the world. And now, our feature presentation. Today on the Last Looks podcast, I'm speaking with wig maker Robert Pickens from Wigmaker Associates. Robert chats about his fascination with wig making as a youngster and how that paved the road that has led him to where he is now owning his own wig making business based in Beverly Hills. We talk about some of the exciting projects he has done and he gives us a little advice as to what can help us hairstylists when working with wigs and our wig makers. Picture up, Last Looks. Rolling and action. Welcome to the Last Looks podcast, Rob. Hi, Jamie Lee. Happy to be here. <laughs> yes, exciting. <laughs> now, I would like you to finish the sentence for me, okay? Okay. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Robert, and when he grew up, he wanted to be... An architect. He did? <laughs> yes, an architect. I um, love that. My grandfather built homes on the side. He owned an auto shop and repaired cars from a very young age and mm. then ultimately built all of our homes we ever lived in. He's built every home they've ever lived in, wow. my grandparents. And so from a, from a very early age, I was working with him, figuring things out, using tools, helping him build our houses, just a handy guy, you know, going around their warehouse, watching him work on the cars, run a business, all of that exciting stuff. That's very cool. So at what point does architecture get left behind and hair stuff steps in? Yeah. So I was always very creative growing up, me and my sister both. My mom would always have us crafting, painting, doing any number of creative things, you know, instead of watching TV we're going to get out the glue and the popsicle sticks and make something and cover it in paint. So we both always had an itch to create. And being a young kid with all this energy that I guess no one knew what to do with, I was put in acting classes at the local children's theater. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas, which is the capital of Arkansas. So we yeah. do have a little bit of art and culture and all of those good things to be exposed to. Yeah. And my mom enrolled me in acting classes as a way to get out some energy. I guess I must have gone to her one day and said, I want to perform. Oh, I actually remember when that is. I saw okay. Lion King on Broadway when I was five. Okay. And I remember that set off like a theatrical kick. It's like we got home and I realized that's a job. People can actually, you know, do this, create, perform for a living. And so I started putting on all kinds of little plays and things at home, played around with crafts, thought I was building props. Um, and that led to my mom enrolling me in acting classes at the Arkansas Children's Theater. And to get to acting class, you had to walk through the scene shop. And then there was a little black box theater behind the main stage where they would teach you improv games, you know, all that variety of stuff. Mm. But having the background of growing up working with tools and being interested in building things and construction and architecture and engineering, my grandma always told me you should be a mechanical engineer. And I thought, how boring. <laughs> to walk through the scene shop to get to acting classes, there was a guy named Mike who built all the scenery. And I started stopping in there and he would let this five, six-year-old, seven-year-old help him build the flats for the new show. So I started skipping acting classes and building scenery. And that started my interest in behind the scenes work. And I thought, you know, being on stage is fun, but I think what these guys do is really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's kind of a funny way into it. And the wig moment was they would have to do quick changes. They would open up this big garage door and do quick changes in the scene shop while the show was going on. Oh, yeah. And I remember one day I'm there working on something and they're doing a quick change. And I was always fascinated. You know, they run off stage. You've got like 10, 15 seconds to basically become a completely different person. Yeah. And being a kid who, in addition to being interested in engineering, I was obsessed with magic as a kid, like illusion, all of that stuff, card tricks. I wanted to know how it worked. I can't even tell you 
the amount of times I saw David Copperfield from like the ages <laughs> of five to 10. I was obsessed, you know, how do they do that? And that tied yeah. into my whole engineering thing. So one day they're doing this quick change and I see them rip a lace front wig off of this actress's head and then put another one on her and she runs off to stage. And I thought, whoa, like I thought that was her hair. <laughs> it was growing right out of her head. Yeah. And then I became fascinated. So I went home and being a kid of the internet age, I got on Google and started looking up wig, theater wig, film wig, which led to lace front wig and all of these, not all of these, because there really were only a handful of the time I found on eBay, a wig making book from years and years ago, like the very rudimentary traditional way of making a wig. Mm -hmm. And I went to my mom and said, I want to buy this. And I want to buy some lace and some hair. And the hook, you know, I showed her the ventilating hook and the holder. Yeah. And she said, okay, and bought it for me. So all <laughs> this stuff shows. <laughs> yay, mom. <laughs> yay, Larry, yay, mom. Shout out to Melissa Tice. Um, <laughs> yeah, she always encouraged our creativity. And mm -hmm. so she bought me the tools that essentially started my wig making career. And all of this was around eight years old, being fascinated by this funny thing called a wig. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting that you went on Google to look up like how these things are made, like how you could mm -hmm. make it instead of just like, where do I buy one of those? Like a pre-made wig to play with instead of, <laughs> going right to the beginning of how is that created that's yeah that's pretty awesome well you know it it just really speaks to the great support system I had around me I mean that engineering brain mm. just I have to know how things are made and built still around the shop today like got to put something together well I'm going to do it like mm. I just I love that stuff loved Legos erector sets yeah all that fun jazz and through the discovery, so I get this book, and I mean, it's one of the first books that's in print. It's barbering and hairdressing has a section of wig making. Like, think of it like a cosmetology book from mm. years and years ago, but specifically about barbering. Yeah. And believe it or not, once you get past the section on using the irons and the ovens, there's a section on wig making and hair processing. Mm -hmm. And through that book and reading and then just researching on the internet. And there was really not anything out there. It's only been over the last few years, I've noticed books that people are writing on how to actually make these things step by step yeah. in the current incarnation as we know them. So I took the lace, put it on a little block, didn't even cover my block on anything, tying straight on canvas, and <laughs> put my pins in it and tied my first knot at eight years old. And oh it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. And then I tried making my first lace front, just putting lace on a weft back wig. And that was a little better. I still have it in a drawer somewhere. You do? I do. I still, that was one thing I thought later on when I was 16, 17, I went, I better keep this. I shouldn't refront this or throw it away. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah so next time you come to the studio, we'll pull out my little five, six hair knot front for you to look at. Oh my God, that's <laughs> so amazing. Yeah, so that kind of continued throughout all my high school years in the background. Through engineering and architecture, I decided I want to be a scenic designer. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I thought that encapsulated everything I wanted to do with my life. And so all through high school, I was the one who built the scenery. I did the lights. I did the wigs and then I didn't like the way they were doing the costumes. So then I had to do the costumes. <laughs> Plus I was auditioning to be in the show. And I mean, they, they let this 14, 15 year old kid up on this 60 foot ladder to change lights. And I was thinking, where were the rules? Like <laughs> they let me do a lot of stuff at my little school that I went to that now that I'm older, I just go, wow, why would you let a kid do that? But I'm really grateful. Yeah, they just let you go for it. Yeah, they just let me go for it. And then I started my first business selling props. I started to realize the shows we were doing in school, there were a couple of them that specifically called for certain props, mm -hmm. like 12 Angry Men, Switchblade Knives, you know, specialty shoes like in Oz and stuff. 
So I decided at 14, well, I can manufacture that. I can do that. And I started a business and, you know, sold every switchblade knife to <laughs> prop fake switchblade knife to yeah. tons of productions of 12 Angry Men all over the US. And I set up a website and started selling those. And that was my first business that then led into, well, not only can I supply props, but I'll supply wigs. So I started trying to sell my wigs. And that started a whole thing. And I had a drama teacher in high school, Hannah Sawyer, who said to me, is this really what you want to do? And I said, yeah, I want to be a scenic designer. And there's one repertory theater, professional theater in Little Rock, Arkansas, for Mm. 400 square miles. And it's called the Arkansas Rep. She said, I used to run shows there when I first started teaching here. You need to meet the production manager. He's a great guy, really creative. And it's a great way to start building connections. This was maybe my ninth, 10th grade year of high school. Yeah. And so I said, great, introduce me. She helped me put together a resume, put my wigs in there. And then that led to me sending it to him. And within 24 hours, he said, come in for an interview. So sophomore year had just started. I yeah. hightailed it, left school early at one o'clock on a Wednesday hightailed it downtown to the Arkansas rep and met with the gentleman who would become my first mentor, who offered me a job on the spot in the costume shop because he Mm. said, can you sew? And I said, of course I can sew. Total lie. My grandmother (laughs) taught me how to sew a button. (laughs) My grandmother, who's another one of my great supporters, taught me how to sew on a button. And I knew how to make a pillow. But I thought, yeah, fake it till you make it. I can sew. And I knew he was also their main costume designer there. Yeah. So I started basically assisting him. I thought, I'm going to be this guy's assistant. I'm going to be the best designer, whatever he's ever seen. Mm. So I'm working away in the costume shop. And one day he comes to me and says, oh, I saw some wigs in your portfolio. I said, Mm. yeah. Do you think you could do some wigs for Les Mis? I said, sure. He goes, okay, great. Well, there's like 70, 80 wigs. Can you do that? Oh, shit. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Now, mind you, this is junior year of high school. I have so many other academic things that I should be doing, but I definitely did not end up doing them. (laughs) And instead, I did, I I think it was like 65 wigs we ended up with in this production of Les Miserables that went from Arkansas Rep to a theater in Phoenix, and it may have gone one other place, I don't remember, Mm. but they billed me in the program as wig designer, which I was thinking, yes, I have made it. I am Mm -hmm. wig designer, printed out, there I am. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was great. It was an incredible moment. And that's kind of when my brain too started to switch into, I really like wigs and people like my wigs and want me to do wigs because once that production went from Little Rock to Phoenix, I started getting calls for design work. Of course I took them. I'm thinking, well, I'll just tell them I'm too busy to travel because I'm a junior in high school and I'll ship them the wigs, communicate with them. And that's what I did. And that (laughs) took me, I know, wild. And that took me through my senior year of high school so I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When you're doing all these wigs, are they, you're just buying these off the shelf. You're not like making these wigs. You're oh, styling them no. and designing them. Well, let me tell you, not just styling and design, because I never wanted to be a hairdresser. That was not, I just never thought about it. Like I had a barber. I loved all my barbers, but yeah. it was like performing on stage. I didn't know it was something you could do. Mm. And As I started my first business and started selling wigs and realizing there's a market for this, there's a huge need for wigs in theater. Mm -hmm. And not only that, people just dressing up and needing wigs, which was never really my cup of tea. I always wanted the theater work. What I started doing was I sought out some manufacturers overseas with lace front wigs. Mm. Through the books I bought, I learned how to make a lace front wig and that continued in the background of all of my high school years as I'm dabbling in all other areas of theater. Yeah. And then I did like Mr. Rob decided I really want to do wigs, but I was fronting the wigs. So I would buy weft back lace front wigs Mm -hmm. or all hand tied wigs made in China or Indonesia. 
Mm -hmm. And I would take a pattern off of the actor if I could. If not, I remember I had three blocks. It was like a 21 inch, a 22 inch, and a 23 inch. And I had drawn these hairlines on the block, just my best guess as what I thought would be a general, good general size. And it turned out it was. I only recently got rid of those blocks. Wow. And I was fronting them. So I would go to school when I was doing Les Miserables, do my classes throughout the day, all mm -hmm. while responding to production emails when I'm supposed to be taking notes on my computer and being <laughs> a, studious, a studious guy. And I would leave school, go home. I think I got off at 2 p.m. I had a dead period or an off period. Mm -hmm. And I would go home and start knotting the wigs. I think for Les Mis, we ended up with 15, 16 wigs that I had actually fronted myself wow. over the course of a few months. Yeah, And then, of course, yes, the rest were commercial lace fronts that I started experimenting with, cutting baby hairs, bleaching knots, you know, all kinds of things to yeah. make them look better for stage which little did I know was overkill for stage. But <laughs> I was always fascinated with how do I make this hairline look the most real? How do I make this object look real? How do I crack the code? Yeah. You're making me feel like the laziest teenager that ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> oh my I goodness. did nothing like that when I was in high school. It's what incredible. What were you doing, Jamie Lee? <laughs> I was, you know, barely kicking it through school and party, partying a bunch. So, you know, I wasn't. Oh, my goodness. I certainly in wasn't doing that. Yeah, in retrospect, I wish that's what I was doing. We can swap because I wish I was doing what you were doing. Oh, my goodness. Well, good. Together we make a great pair. So you are juggling high school and a business and mm -hmm. designing wigs and things for Productions. For the local theater, plus yeah. renting some through the internet. Yeah. And the next pivotal moment that came, so I should mention this guy's name, Rafael Castanera at mm -hmm. the Arkansas Rep, brilliant costume designer, great production manager, was really my first mentor who started honing my design eye, you know, talking about how the wig interacts with the costume yeah, and how hairline placement creates a character. That was my first introduction to the objects, whether it be the costumes, the props, the wig, how that relates to the character and setting the tone for the circumstance, the location, the time, you know, all of that basic stuff. Yeah. And he introduced me to his mentor. She was head of the master's in costume design at a school called UT Knoxville in okay. East Tennessee. Yeah. And Marianne showed up in the costume shop. Raphael said, I want you to meet this designer I'm bringing in to do this play, or it was a musical. It was a world premiere musical that they were workshopping there mm -hmm. um, with some guys from New York. That was the one thing in retrospect about this theater, just a side tangent. Hmm. Bob Hupp, the producing artistic director, has still has great relationships with theaters all across the com country. So I didn't realize for being in Little Rock, Arkansas, I was getting great exposure and yeah. met tons of people that I still work with today. Oh, and I was amazing. meeting them when I was in high school. Yeah, yeah, it was really a great place. And he introduced me to Marianne Custer. So she started talking to me about her school, talking to me about what I do, what I want to do. And she said, why don't you and your mom come up to UT Knoxville? I'll show you around. We'll meet with the head of the department. We'll talk about what we can do. I never wanted to live in a dorm. And I kept saying, I run a business. I don't want to live in a dorm. I run a business. So... <laughs> <laughs> long story short we go see the school hmm. Marianne helps me get a great scholarship apply to the school she helped me get a waiver to not live on campus so I could keep running my business mm -hmm. and that's what I did for the next year and a half after high school I went to UT Knoxville I pretty much became their wig department their wig designer vendor building all of the wigs myself I had no help designing shows with Marianne for repertory theaters, still building and designing wigs for Arkansas Rep and shipping them back. And after about a year and a half of doing that, mm. which was really my only college experience, a scholarship I was supposed to get for the other semester didn't quite pan out. So I made the decision, I'm going to go back to Arkansas. Like maybe I'll just finish school there, get a degree to have a degree. But really, mm. I just want to keep working. Because mind you, I'm going to college, but that still doesn't mean I'm not leaving for a week to go do tech somewhere and trying yeah. to juggle classes. I never stopped working. 
So Marianne is the one who sat me down and she said, I really don't know how much we can teach you here. You're getting a lot of great experience. Mm. And while I encourage you to stay here, maybe go back and figure out like exactly what you want to do. Yeah. So I went back to Arkansas. I was there for three months and my grandmother, my mom's mom, one of her friends her son-in-law is the actor Judge Reinhold. Neil from Santa Claus, the Tim Allen Santa Clauses and Soda yeah. Jerk, Beverly Hills Cop. Mm-hmm. Well, he saw one of my shows. We did Memphis, the musical in Little Rock, Arkansas. And he found out that was Marguerite's grandson and said, great, how can I help him? Oh. And she said, here's his email address. He wants you to send him your portfolio and he's going to see what he can do for you. Well, this man who I still have never met to this day, <laughs> Our only communication was through email uh, and one phone call. He forwarded my resume to someone he worked with on his very first Western when he was a young actor starting out. And they filmed, shot this movie somewhere like New Mexico, Arizona. And yeah. the hairdresser was Linda Flowers. Oh, wow. Who, yeah. Do you know Linda? I know her by reputation and name. I do not know Linda. Yeah. So he gets me the phone number to Linda Flowers. So she's a dear friend of mine. I want you to give her a call. This is what you need to say to her. He gave me a script, basically. Yeah. So I call her. She doesn't answer. I leave a voicemail. A couple days go by. I'm driving my car down Chanel Parkway in Little Rock, Arkansas, and almost run off the road when my phone rings, and it says Linda Flowers, (laughs) really big. (laughs) So I pull over the car real quick and talk to Linda, and she's, you know, kind enough to take five minutes to call this kid from Arkansas back. Well, mm-hmm. she's on the set of her movie and says, Victoria Wood just made my toupee for Woody Harrelson on this film. And I think you should meet her. I saw your work. I think you should give her a call. She's a really good friend of mine. And the very next day I called Victoria Wood and we ended up speaking on the phone for three hours of oh her quizzing God. me. <laughs> it, it was a pretty great first meeting. I get really, really nostalgic about it. We spoke for three hours. I asked all the questions I had been dying to ask any wig maker. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh my God. Years worth of questions. (laughs) (laughs) Years and years worth of questions, which before I circle back to that, I should mention Marianne Custer at UT Knoxville. Mm. My first wig maker that I met who really changed my view on what a wig could be. Marianne said, I'm taking the grad students Mind you, this is my first semester of college. (laughs) She goes, I'm taking the grad students to New York. I take them to visit all the costume shops, Eric Winterlane, Martin Escuerdo. They go to all that. And she introduces them to get jobs, know where to have stuff built if they get a show. Mm. And she told all of them, this kid who I'm building all their wigs because they're the grad students designing all the shows. I hightail it to New York with them. And get to go to all the costume shops on the grad student trip. And then Marianne takes me over to meet Mr. Paul Huntley at his brownstone in New York. Just me. And it was very funny. All the other kids were a little, I think, a little bothered that (laughs) it was just me who got to have an audience with Paul. (laughs) So I sat down with Paul and he gave me a couple hours of his time and showed me some real lace, some real Swiss lace. And some hair and looked at my portfolio and just spent time sharing with me, telling me stories. And he just goes, you know, you, your wigs are good because I brought one to show him in person. And you yeah. know, he barely looked at it because he knew he knew what he was looking at. Yeah. The one thing he said was your temples should be light as air. And I hadn't even thought about the different densities of a hairline. Yeah. I was just doing theatrical hairlines as quickly as possible. And with that one tweak, we did a Midsummer Night's Dream, Marianne and I next. Mm-hmm. And she said, "What's what did you take away from this? And I said, temple's light as air. I'm going to do that. And I did it. Yeah. Next thing you know, no one knows people are wearing wigs. <laughs> that started a whole, a whole thing. Not to mention the many other questions that Mr. Huntley answered for me before I got connected with Victoria Wood out here in L.A. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah. I don't know if I ever told you that. <laughs> no. The, how lucky you are. That's so awesome. I mean, oh, just, I can't even imagine you must have just been bursting at the seams with like, oh my God, oh my God, what can I ask these people? What mm-hmm. can I find out? What have I not been able to figure out? Or what have I not been able to find online or in books that I can squeeze mm-hmm. out of these these people who have 
so much experience. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know if I was even thinking about that because right. I just had so many questions and yeah. it became an obsession. How do I look at this knowing how the trick is done? And it disappeared to my eye. That's where my brain was going. Mm, I was cool. nervous as hell. <laughs> but for different reasons. I was more nervous meeting the man who had done over 300 Broadway shows. Yeah. That was more, and I don't know if you ever went to Paul Huntley's Brownstone. You show up, beautiful iron gate, gilded plaque on the side that says Paul Huntley. There's gravitas <laughs> showing yeah. up to the Brownstone. <laughs> it wasn't like just walking up to someone's apartment. Yeah. So, you know, all of these people have been so kind to entertain me and my many questions. And that continues to this day, the curiosity. Of course. And then one day someone's going to be knocking on your door, asking a million questions. <laughs> oh, goodness. I hope I'm nice. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you will be. <laughs> so what happens after your conversation with Victoria? So after my conversation with Victoria on the phone, she's getting real excited. I'm getting real excited. I'm thinking, wow, this person is so easy to talk to and they're so helpful. Mm. She says, what are you doing? And I said, I just scheduled my classes for upcoming semester. What are you taking? Business, uh, English, math, whatever I needed to continue my degree. Mm. And she goes, do you think you convince your parents for you to take a semester off? And I was like, no, I really don't think so. And she said, well, come out for two weeks. This was in, gosh, when was this? Like October, December so the new year was coming, Christmas was coming. She said, I've got family mm -hmm. stuff through the holidays. Why don't you plan to come see me? Let's pick a date. So we chose like January 7th because her mm -hmm. mom's birthday was in early January. And I said, okay, great. She said, come see me. You'll spend a week and we'll go from there. She was just so willing right off the bat to mentor me and immediately offered for me to fly out. She offered for me to stay at the house. And I said, oh, like, I don't really know you. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll stay at a hotel. And she gave me a recommendation of a place nearby and said, don't rent a car because I'm, you know, like 18, 19 at this point. Mm -hmm. And you can't rent a car. <laughs> and Uber wasn't a thing. I took a taxi from LAX down to Long Beach. Mm. Uh, Victoria's house was over by Cal State Long Beach. She gave me the address, everything, where to find it. I went to the hotel. I walk in. But she had left a huge gift basket in my room Aww. with a, I know, so sweet, with a little black book and a pen for me to take notes. And she was coming to take me to lunch that day. So I went to lunch with her and her husband, Bob, and just chatted. And we spent maybe an hour at lunch. And I was like, I want to get back to the wig studio. I want to see this. Yeah. So we show up at her house, we walk down the long driveway, should also mention the license plate of her car says wig maker. So that's what picked me up. She had that <laughs> license plate for over 40 years that said wig maker. That's awesome. Yeah. So the wig maker car picks me up, takes me to the studio and I walk in, I see, you know, the, her assistant, the people working with her and mm. on the wall, the way she organized the hair was in these little magazine boxes. And each magazine box had people's name on it, like Jamie Foxx, Melissa McCarthy, Barbara Streisand. And that's when it really set in. Yeah. I thought, this is it. This is where I want to work. This woman can tell me everything I need to know, answer every question. Mm -hmm. And we jumped right in. She said, what's the first thing you want to do? I said, crown swirl. I really have never gotten a crown swirl. Okay, well, show me what you do. Do you want a parting with it? Sure. So in like, I, it was an hour and a half or something ridiculous. I knotted this huge parting, all cross knot, mm. knotted a crown, showed it to her. She goes, wow, you did all this? I'm like, yeah. And Shows me, she gives me a couple notes on the crown and says, Well, just do another crown. Look, I see you can cross knot. I see you can tie a good knot. Great. I did a crown. And I still have those samples here somewhere, too. I'll have to show them <laughs> to you next time. And then I had a few other questions. She showed me some of her wigs. She was working on a couple fronts at the time, talked mm. to me about the fronting, showed me my first real good hair, nice virgin European. And after two days, she goes, Do you want to go to lunch? And I said, Yeah. And at lunch, she says, well, what do you want to do for the rest of the week? I thought, I don't know. She goes, well, I've kind of showed you everything I can at this point. 
and now I just want to invite you to work with me. Mm. Gulp, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course the answer was yes. And so then she took me back to the studio and said, I have all these books. And she showed me this bookshelf that I don't know how I didn't notice it. All of these books that I either couldn't get my hands on or didn't mm. even know existed. Yeah. And took them back to the hotel that night and stayed up until 2 or 3 a.m. culling through them. And I came back with maybe six, seven, eight pages of all of my questions <laughs> on how to build a wig. Why do you do this versus that? How yeah. can I fix this problem? And I'm realizing I must be somewhat of a hoarder. I have all of those notes somewhere too. <laughs> That I still keep to this day <laughs> from that first week with Victoria. And yeah. then after that, excuse my language on this next quote, but I was leaving to go back to Arkansas. Yeah. And she had sat me down at breakfast that day at her kitchen table. We had some tea. She loves her tea and said, what do you want to do? Do you want to do this? Do this. And she was saying, we'll go back home. And you know, if you move to Los Angeles, there's a lot of traffic. There's this, she was giving me the full rundown mm. that in retrospect, I'm going, that woman wanted me <laughs> to move out to LA. <laughs> the cab pulls up. I put my bags in. I give her a hug because we had really hit it off and she was already such a special person to me. Yeah. She puts me in the cab, leans her head in the door and says, well, you're in the A-list. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> Slams the cab door and off to Arkansas I went. So two weeks later, I call her and say, I want to move to LA. And we started that process, found me a condo close to her studio and away we go. Then six months in, she says, do you want to start a business together? Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's amazing. So when you went home, was it full on conversation with mom and stuff like that to kind of? Pretty much. We had already been chatting every day I was there. And I remember yeah. Victoria said, do you want to move out? And I called my mom and said, I really want to move out, even if it's just for a year. People mm -hmm. take gap years. Like, this is my gap year. And I had an actor who a long time ago, like, not too terribly long, but my junior year, I was running a show and we were starting to think about colleges. And he said to my parents, you really should just take all that money and put it towards, you know, everything you would have spent on college. Spend it sending him around to different wig makers. Like, he's such a sponge at this yeah. point. Do that. Yeah. And that stuck with my parents, that right. that guy who had no reason to show interest in me was saying, I travel around, these wigs are really good, you should cultivate this. By these key people who came into my life, the foundation mm. had already been laid for them. It was a very easy conversation. Yeah. In retrospect, my mom was terrified to let her kid move 2,000 miles away to Los Angeles. I'm and, sure. you know, I had the support of them to do that. So it was a fairly easy conversation. The progression mm. had been very natural. Yeah. So I was out here within within three months of meeting Victoria. I had moved to Long Beach and started assisting her in her studio. That's awesome. And then however many months later, she's going into business with you. Yeah, it was about six months later, I kind of started taking on the responsibilities just naturally of running the shop, starting some client communication. Mm -hmm. And she had said to me from the very beginning, I don't want to keep going forever. I mean, everyone retires at some point. Yeah. And so I, being ambitious and coming from a business-minded family, mm. started to say, well, who's going to take over your business? And <laughs> blah, blah. Like, we started to have those conversations naturally. We yeah. both found each other at the perfect time. Mm. Those conversations came naturally. And we started... We'd make her associates together before the year was out. That's amazing. And you haven't looked back, have you? I have not had a chance to look back. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me, the important question here is, what happened to the props business? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there may still be a website uh, somewhere <laughs> out in the ether of the internet. <laughs> and if that inbox is full, I'm sorry, I'm not <laughs> running resin handles and molds anymore. Oh. But if you need a custom wig, I'm your guy. Well, hopefully some other kid has taken over your uh, your clientele. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they have. And I hope they have. That is one thing now having the business and where we've come from Long Beach, moving up to Beverly Hills, now being full owner of the business. There are mm -hmm. a few moments where 
people will reach out and say, I want to work from you. And I think, oh, I hope, you know, I hope they were doing what I was doing. And lo and behold, they're out there. Who knew? Yeah, It's exciting. It's really exciting. It is. I just, I, I just love the, God, just such full on passion from such a young age and so inquisitive. Like it's incredible. When, when, we, when did you build your first wig from start to finish? How old were you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Roundabout. Well, I started my first full build probably when I was 10, 12, somewhere in that timeline. Oh my God. I, I mean, a lot of other things happened in the background. So the timeline's kind of hard to pinpoint sometimes. Mm. Yeah, but for probably about ten, twelve, I built my first full lace cap, the very old style, because the only book I had, Terry Net, big big darts, and I tied that wig over maybe a six month period, off and on, mm-hmm. and then my first full wig for a show was I built all of the Jean Valjean wigs for Les Mis was my other first full build. Wow. And as much as it probably irritates you that I call you this, I just need to let everybody know that I call you the Doogie Hauser of wig making. (laughs) (laughs) And you're just proving my point. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I know. I love that you call me that. And it just, (laughs) it's flattery in all sincerest forms from someone who I enjoy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, it only kind of lands when people are old enough to know who Doogie Howser is. <laughs> <laughs> and to remind you, I do know who Doogie Howser is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember the first time you said that, you go, do you even know who Doogie Howser is? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, or am I just showing my age right now? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I guess when you put it like that, and I hear myself telling the story, I guess I will have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I certainly wasn't cutting anybody's hair when I was 10 years old. I mean, maybe some dolls, yeah. but that was... I wasn't it. either, but um, hairdressing came naturally for me out of... When you build a wig, mm. you have to then... I kept looking at it going, wow, I finally can build a great wig, but I can't cut and style it. The right. things that really bring it to life. So hairdressing for me came naturally from that. And after I bought all the wig making books that are still on my shelf today that I could find, I then started buying cosmetology books, Mm -hmm. trying to learn hair cutting. I really always loved geometry and engineering, all that came naturally. So the angles, the curve of the head always made sense to me. And ultimately did go get my cosmetology license and I'm a fully licensed cosmetologist at this point. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, you don't really, I wonder how many, no, every wig maker must know how to style hair, right? I would assume. I think, I think when you interact with hair enough, you, you are a hairdresser of a sense, even if you're a wig maker, sometimes even have more extensive knowledge, especially of the, the science of hair and Mm. how it interacts with each other and with any products that may be used on it. I should also mention in that whole span of time, I did like my first off-Broadway show at 16 and did some other stuff some big opportunities that people like Marianne gave to me in theater before I ever even met Victoria and moved into film god it just sounds like your teenage years you were the busiest person on the planet it's incredible I loved every second of it I mean I like to be a busy person I like my job it's obvious you're a hard worker (laughs) (laughs) well you are too (laughs) yeah well I'm trying to make up for being a lazy teenager (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I think it's kind of stuck in my brain that I'm just inherently lazy. And then people look at me like, are you crazy? You, well, it's you're that drive. far from it's lazy. Drive. Yeah. Listen, exactly. I feel lazy too. I feel guilty sometimes for going home when I should be nodding hair, but I've learned the value of rested eyes. Oh, absolutely. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Balance, man. Got to have it. Exactly. Balance, <laughs> balance. Um, so now that you are in... Beverly Hills and mm-hmm. you are running your amazing business. Let's chat about some of the projects and builds that you've done that are some favorites. Absolutely. Well, where to begin? I mean, all of my favorites are with you. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm like, how do we later. rephrase that? <laughs> yeah. How do we rephrase that so I don't upset a few people? Um, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, obviously some projects that we have worked together on are very special to me. Am I allowed to mention them? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> None of them are out yet. That's why I'm no, like, yeah. Not really? None of them have um, come out yet. I know. Babylon we just did was so fun. Don't worry, darling. I can't wait for and blonde. 
where we got to do our many, many Maryland wigs. Um, yeah. Really excited for all of those. We work a lot <laughs> on the Ryan Murphy TV shows, which was something that Victoria started to cultivate long before I ever came around. So Chris Clark has become one of my great collaborators. Michelle Seglia, Barry Limo, Alan Dangero, but he's not Ryan Murphy world. I mean, I could go on and on. I'm so blessed to work with so many wonderful people. Yeah, well, I mean, the Ryan Murphy, they're constantly creating and such mm-hmm. amazing content too. So that is always fun. And people love his shows. So Absolutely. I mean, brilliant content with a a stylized eye that has kind of penetrated the ether of everything. I mean, it's like mm. every show you watch on TV now didn't look like that when American Horror Story first rolled onto the scene. Yeah. So definitely his period work and the stylistic element is always fun for us to create. You know, Chris Clark and I always have our very favorites and me and Michelle too. You know, we get down to the nitty gritty of just a few hairs, a different color right here will make all the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, we have our favorite blonde from, uh, from ratchet that goes you know from a level five all the way up to a level 12 there's so many colors in that wig and it's on screen for like 20 minutes max (laughs) (laughs) it was worth it (laughs) Mm -hmm. worth every second it's the stuff that never makes it on screen that's heartbreaking (laughs) truly truly and we all especially this time of year i mean we're in december and doing the review and reaching out to the clients hearing that some things you camera tested that were you know a big 10 are on the cutting room floor (laughs) it's a bit of a heartbreak for the painstaking amount of work and thought we put into this yeah so throughout all your projects that you've been involved with Mm. what what are some of the ones that have been more challenging maybe and why I would say that each project has its own specific challenges Mm. The way you build a wig, it's hair and lace, it's knots. It's how you use the knots, the direction you tie them in, the origin of the hair, the processing or not processing of the hair. Yeah. All of those things pretty much stay the same. But then you get into the circumstance of the story, which is something that I love in my collaborations with Alan Dangero specifically, Mm. who I met through Victoria, thinking about you know, if this character is progressing in their sickness, how do we communicate that through the hair? Whether that's looking at actual photos and pulling the design inspiration or giving it that little bit of Hollywood touch to help the audience get there with us. Those are the details. The devil is truly in the details. And in the painstaking work of creating a character, that's what I find not only the most challenging, but the most rewarding is the collaborative process of getting from hair and lace to a living breathing character on the screen yeah do you find it difficult at all being sometimes so disconnected from the final product I will say sometimes the speed of our business Mm. sometimes the speed at which we're forced to work doesn't leave time in the process yeah so that's another challenging thing Uh, you know, you need time to meet, collaborate, build a wig, fit, refine. Yeah. That should be the process always. We're not always allowed that. No. So it can be difficult to. Exactly. Exactly. Or, you know, you're not always brought out in the timeline to go to a camera test that's half a world away and you just need four more hairs on a temple. Mm. You just can't always do that. So yeah. being disconnected in that regard is challenging. Yeah. Do you do you feel like there's sometimes you feel okay not being at that camera test because you understand that the person you're working with has an eye to be able to see what needs to be done if any adjustments need to happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just for the proper steps of a process, I do prefer to be there mm. and do always offer to be there. You never know. You know, sometimes it's as simple as we put the wig on the actor's head in the trailer and I never even make it behind the monitor. Mm. That is where improving the quality of the work, even in the shortest timelines, I do prefer to do. But obviously, I mean, have I been at every one of your camera tests? (laughs) 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so yes, there are circumstances. That doesn't mean we're not texting like crazy and talking on the phone if there's a small adjustment that we need to to discuss. Yeah. But yeah, if I can be there, I prefer to be. There are definitely people who I trust implicitly. That's helpful. It is. It's very helpful. <laughs> so, I mean, you are so passionate about your work, so I'd love to know a little bit more about what what you find rewarding. Mm. What do I find rewarding? Yeah. What are those moments where you're just like, all that sweat and blood and tears mm-hmm. has been worth it because of this? <laughs> Well, you know, I love when we're trying on a wig and it pops, you know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) You might have to explain what that means so people understand, because I know what it means and it's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the moment at the very first fitting where you've wrapped the actor's hair, you get the front lace in position. It's the very first time you're putting the wig on and you're coming just over the crown as you pull it down and you're thinking, this isn't going to fit, this isn't going to fit. And then it just pops into place and all the edges are lined up. The hair falls beautifully. You love the texture. Those are some of the most rewarding moments for me personally. Yeah, it's snug, it's comfortable. Mm-hmm. It just all falls into place. Yeah. It's, it's that moment amazing. of ah, we we did it. We nodded it. <laughs> it is complete to an extent. Um yeah. but also the biggest joy is, you know, we all love being at a camera test when you're standing there for 15 minutes thinking why hasn't the actor gone on camera? And the AD rolls around and goes, are you going to put her in her wig yet? Yeah. And we all look, <laughs> and we all look at each other and go, she's been in her wig for a half hour. <laughs> Those are also the, the fun moments. Tricking the eye. I mean, that's the thing. Go, it goes back to the magic illusion, the engineering. Tricking yeah. the eye. Anytime I can do that, those are truly the joyful moments, the bliss of we did our job. Absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah. You're creating a head of hair, aren't you? I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's got to look real. Unless exactly. it's meant to look like a wig. Does that happen very often? Do you get jobs like that come in? Um, I get jobs like that, and then I try to pivot the perspective of that job. What I mean by that is I'll get a call and they'll say, you know, we need a wig and it's a toupee, but it really, it needs to look like a bad toupee. So can you right. make it look like a bad toupee? Uh-huh. And after some conversation, my response is always, what we can do is, yeah, we can make it a little more dense or maybe the texture of the hair is a little funny. Uh-huh. But I find in those circumstances, you still need to build pretty much the best you can build. The knotting is the same. There's still a crown. There's still a parting. Then the hairstylist comes in applying it and styling it in a way that makes it look comical, if that's the case, or something just a little bit off. Right. If that makes sense. I find it's better for me as the viewer, you know, until that moment comes up where you take it off your head on camera and the joke is you're in a bad toupee. Yeah. It better leave the audience going, is that their hair? Is it not their hair? Is it supposed to look like that? Mm. It should still keep them guessing, in my opinion. Yeah. I imagine that if it just needs to, from the first moment you see it look so incredibly bad, you'll probably just say, well, why don't you just go and buy a bad toupee off? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. That's when I tell you, that's when I tell you to treat yourself to an Amazon wig. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much. I mean, that's just, it's just a painful situation for everyone to be in. I just. Correct. (laughs) Correct. It's like, what? I have to make it look like shit. Oh, that's a mm-hmm. challenge within itself. It is. So. For some of us, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was going to say, as a wig maker, what are some words of wisdom that you may like to share with hairstylists that are working with your wigs or just custom made wigs in general? I think it's really invaluable. Understand the basic construction, how a knot is tied, how the different directions it's tied in may affect the the outcome of what you're doing to it with your iron or with your roller. Proper blocking, padding out a head block, setting knots when you wash a wig, not just washing it, sitting it there, letting it dry overnight and expecting it to fall right back into place. You have to work mm-hmm. the crown back in. The baby hairs, you may want to cut some and set it while it's wet. 
those are all things I think worth playing around with in yeah. the handling of a custom wig. I'm going to expand and go in a slightly different direction and okay. <laughs> <laughs> and say this is an assumption, but I'm guessing that sometimes working with hairstylists who have a wig and maybe something's not working for them with it. I mean, the best thing to always do is to ask the wig maker why something may not be working for them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because it may it may be something so simple that you maybe haven't come across before as a hairstylist or just, you know, may not have the experience that the wig maker has with how these things work that the wig maker can guide you as to well maybe try this or maybe like have you Mm -hmm. done it this way because I think there seems to be sometimes a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction to this wig isn't right or you know that it's broken in some way that it hasn't been made (laughs) correctly or that because you can't get it to do something that you thought you it should be able to do absolutely and it's so easy to blame the inanimate object but Mm. i i always try to encourage everyone i'm working with call me if you have a question call the wig maker send me a photo just say what can i do this is happening and if it's something that needs to be adjusted in the physical construction Mm -hmm. to maybe the parting change you know that happens all the time we build it for a left well everyone decides they want it center that is an actual nodding adjustment that may yeah. need to happen. Um, always call the wig maker. Happy to provide solutions, troubleshoot. That's part of the collaboration. And whether it's the setting of the knot or if you want to adjust the color and have some questions, mm. we know where the hair came from. I can yeah. advise to you on everything that's been done to that hair, if anything, and we can troubleshoot it together. It's the same reason you leave the lace long at a camera test because mm. what if the director says the wig is great but let's bring that hairline down an inch yeah well if you don't have the lace left to do that you're now having to have an entire wig refronted yeah. just because of a knee-jerk reaction because someone at the camera test said i see lace so you cut it off mm-hmm. it's a camera test we're going to leave the lace just in case something comes up yeah so i think just having that open dialogue with the wig maker, right? Just feel comfortable and asking for Absolutely. guidance or help if you don't quite get it. With the wig maker and with production, mm. let everyone know what you need so that they can give it to you. Yeah, which I think can be difficult. It can be difficult because it can just slip away, mm. as you were saying, with the time when you're restricted with time and everything's happening so quickly. And then Correct. if communication isn't open between you guys, I mean, you've got to time you have to get this wig made correct and i mean our business puts so much pressure on everyone in all aspects Mm -hmm. and it comes down to the first thing i say when people call you know how long do we need to build a wig four to six weeks can we do it faster yes that's considered a rush project we do take those on we can build a wig in a week but you should plan four to six weeks for the entire process and that's Mm -hmm. always great to go to production when you're accepting a job I read the script. We need three wigs. It's going to take four to six weeks. Our actor's deal is closed. And you can speak to this also. Are the deals closed? Can we get fittings? We need to start getting their wig made so it's not a rush. Yeah, that's normally where I'm hitting my head against a brick wall is because (laughs) they either haven't even cast somebody or the deal isn't closed and we can't Mm -hmm. have communication with them. And it's just like, are you kidding me? Come on. (laughs) We're shooting in two weeks. This needs to happen now. Well, it needed to happen three weeks ago, but yeah, (laughs) you know. Yes, all of those business things that tie creative hands. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So I'm assuming, well, you being you, Rob, and loving to learn and teaching yourself and reaching out to wherever you can for information. I'm guessing that you're learning new stuff all the time still. What's something exciting that you've learned recently? Oh, goodness. Where do I begin? (laughs) (laughs) You're like constantly every day. (laughs) Truly, though, constantly every day, there's a funny little box that stuff gets put in that someone has labeled Rob's experiments. <laughs> <laughs> because it. I'm always, it's so funny. I'm always taking, when I saw that label, I just laughed. I was like, oh my God, who wrote this on here? Um, yeah. 
I'm always doing something with hair. And recently, all of these books dating back hundreds of years, I've just been fascinated with for years. And there's Mm -hmm. many processing techniques, very traditional for things that we do to hair to texturize it, get different colors and proper lightening. So not using lightening powder, a more natural, less damaging way to do it has Mm -hmm. been something I've been trying to improve and do properly for many, many years. And recently have gotten to a point with the batch lightening that I'm very happy with. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's very cool. So one of those things that I read back in a book when I was 10 years old and could never figure out how to do. So pretty, pretty excited about that one. That's amazing. So everyone from now on can only have blonde wigs or wigs? That- <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only making blonde wigs. I'm yeah. only making blonde wigs from now on. He's like, all the hair that I have in the shop has been lightened. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, truly. Thank you. And <laughs> Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. <laughs> so when you're looking for, because I assume you're not just, well, I know that you're not just working by yourself, that you have wonderful people helping you on Correct. a daily basis. So when you're looking to hire crew, what are you generally looking for? Like, what do you need in someone? I need someone who can tie a clean, tight knot, so ventilating the process of tying hair into lace. Mm. And I'm like, is this a job posting? Minimum five years experience. Um <laughs> Yeah, good attitude, willing to learn, tie a tight, clean knot. That's what it comes down to when I'm looking for someone. Right. And so they've got that that experience, that minimum of five years experience behind them. Um, Mm -hmm. I guess they have to be willing to change how they knot or... Correct. I have a very specific... A set of techniques that we use in constructing our wigs. So yes, mm-hmm. training people who may have worked for another wig maker who moved to Los Angeles and want to work for us. There is a trial period where it is just me training them in the way we do things and how I like my wigs built. Yeah. I guess it's kind of a, a signature, a signature. Like a signature right? style. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I assume you can look at other wigs that have been made by other wig makers and there must be some that you just, if there's no label in it, you know who made it. Oh, absolutely. I know who made every wig we come across just by the foundation style, the knotting. You can get a pretty good guess as to who made it. We all have our different techniques that we use. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's exciting. It's fun. And yeah, I'm sure you get the odd one that you're like, oh, haven't seen this before. Who might this be? (laughs) (laughs) I do. I recently found... I knew who it was, but I was so excited by the label. I found a wig from Wig Speciality in London from years and years ago. And I came across it in uh, someone's kit who had retired. Mm. And I snagged it and took it back to the studio. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. You're going to have to put all these things on display, you know, at some point. I am. I am. (laughs) This is my first wig that I made. This is my... (laughs) (laughs) Maybe not that, but definitely the... uh, Definitely like my old Lana Turner and the wig specialities wig are going to have to be displayed at some point. Oh, come on. Can't you do some type of look at where I was? Look at where I am now. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like that's something they do long after I'm gone, Jamie Lee. (laughs) All right. All right. (laughs) Fine. Yeah. So what have you worked on recently that we can look out for? Oh, many, many, many things. I'm sure you've got, you've got work coming in from, all sorts of different projects. But what, are, <laughs> what, what are you looking forward to seeing? Well, specifically what's about to come out that I just saw a preview for the other day. It looks like a really, a really fun movie is Don't Look Up. We did Jennifer Lawrence for that movie. Oh, cool. She's got um, those cute short little bangs and stuff. It looks fun. Yeah, she does in a shaved side that, you know, is on one of the wigs and nailing that color down was quite the collaboration between myself and Patty Dehaney to get to get it just right before filming all in the middle of a pandemic so oh fun yeah (laughs) real real (laughs) exciting stories we all have from working during that time and then we have michelle pfeiffer that i did with you as betty ford in first ladies i'm also looking forward to seeing that that was fun i mean what what some hairstyles geez wow yeah i'm sure everybody hopes that those styles don't really come back around (laughs) 
<laughs> <laughs> like in fashion. It's just like you look back at some of yeah. some styles in history and you're like, please, God, no. Truly. Um, but when you're Michelle Pfeiffer, they still just, you know. Oh, yeah. She looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how she does it, but it's, yeah. yeah, she's Effortless. incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So greatly looking forward to that. We ended up with what? six wigs by the time it was all done and mm. many years of Betty Ford. So that was a fun one. And we just finished a movie. I don't know when it's going to come out. They're still shooting moving on. That's a movie Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda are making together. Oh, and that's so much fun. Yeah. It's really exciting. And I was able to do both of their wigs for that project. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that and, you know, we've done some exciting wigs for Sigourney Weaver lately that should be out in the next year uh, nice. with your friend, Georgia. <laughs> Georgia Lockhart Adams. Shout Woo-hoo. out to Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, some really exciting things. It's hard to keep track of when they're all coming down, but I've seen, you know, previews for those recently. Really looking forward to it. I know you guys have so much stuff going out. It must be difficult to kind of keep track of actually watching it on screen and and seeing the final product because I'm sure sometimes you'd send that wig out and you just never hear from them again and you're like oh I hope it worked out (laughs) (laughs) correct no absolutely I mean a lot of people think our part of the job ends when the wig shows up in a box and take it from there never contact me again um, <laughs> I just did that recently. I'm, I, I'm going to just say that I'm actually guilty of that just this other week. <laughs> <laughs> I realized when I started talking to you, I was like, oh, I never let Rob know how that wig was. But I think no news is normally good news with me. So, <laughs> With you, yes. And I knew <laughs> I, we were talking about other things while that was going on. So I knew you would have mentioned it if, yeah. <laughs> if there was something you needed. That's so funny. I didn't even realize that. Oh, um, yeah, no, I had no <laughs> idea. So you can take that off of your guilt list. Okay. <laughs> so exciting things, exciting things. So throughout everything, coming up the way you did, coming across so many different mentors and people teaching and showing you stuff, you asking all these incredible questions that you need answers to, mm-hmm. what's some advice that has been given to you that has really stuck? Don't build a wig, build a head of hair. <laughs> and we've been, yeah, it's so simple, but yeah. that's something that was said to me by Victoria, and it is what I have been perfecting on ever since. Yeah. Don't build a wig, build a head of hair. Yeah. And I think that is a great piece of advice for hairstylists working with wigs. Oh, correct. Yeah. I mean, my view of it is we all innately know what hair should look like. Mm. It grows out of our own heads. We're looking Mm. at it, natural hair on people's heads all day. So Mm. the techniques we use as wig makers to make the hair move naturally, to make the hairline Mm. look natural, those are all things that we have to consider to trick the eye. Because if you're watching the screen, the wind's blowing, and someone's hair isn't moving, Mm. that's where the audience who knows nothing about wigs, nothing about what we did to create that look goes, hmm, what's going, is that a, what are they doing? So all of those things we consider to build a head of hair, it's the same as if you were doing a period movie. How do I create this period look? Mm. A lot of times it's using the exact tools they would have used to create that look, the same setting method. Yeah, it's about building a head of hair and then styling it as you would hair to create the illusion. That's true. I always like to, there's an extra step on there too, like once it actually is on the actor's head and they're in there doing what they do is just encouraging them to not be scared of it. Oh, absolutely. They need to own it. Like it, I mean, I'm not telling you to go out and tell your actors how to act, but certainly (laughs) don't. But I do. I'm guilty of that. (laughs) But certainly don't, don't make them feel like they can't touch it. Mm -hmm. Don't make them feel that it doesn't belong to their head because those little moments when an actor touches the hair on the wig or it does something, it just sells it so much more. Mm -hmm. If they, yeah, it just, it connects it all together so much better. Amen. I mean, amen. I am, I am always the one who they say, you know, what do I do with it? What do I do? I say, it's yours. Touch it, interact with it. I'm all the time 
teaching them how to touch it because it is an object. It's just like mm. costumes. You know, mm. I, one thing I learned from Anne Roth and Alan also, um, but Anne Roth specifically taught me about how to speak to an actor to interact with the costume. I've only worked with Anne a handful of times, mm. but I'll never forget being in a fitting. It was for a period show. She's talking to the actor about how to move in the clothes, how to make the audience believe that they are this person living in this garment that she's created. Mm -hmm. And that translates into the wig also. She was one of mm -hmm. the first costume designers that really brought up the subject of, well, it's going to be, you know, up for this scene, the clip comes out, it falls over her left shoulder. Then she runs her hands through the left side, tucks it behind her ear, giving the choreography of how to interact with the object and teaching the actor how to interact with it. It's like if you're putting on a pair of glasses, you're not going to shove it straight through the lace. You're going to put it over the hair just on top of the wig because mm -hmm. it is an object that is on your head that we're trying to create the illusion that mm -hmm. it's your own. And so just last week, I had an actress sitting here who has a great movie coming out, a really exciting role for her. And she was telling me how she learned to smoke, never smoked in her entire life. Mm -hmm. And they were teaching her how to hold the herbal cigarettes, do the whole thing. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. That's another conversation with another person for another time. <laughs> but she goes, oh, well, maybe I'll tuck it behind my ear and I'll do this. So we spent some minutes teaching her how to interact with the wig. She wanted to pull it up and do a ponytail at one point. How can she do that and not mm -hmm. be afraid of, of the wig? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's all those little things that are going to sell it so hard. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I worry that there's a lot of stylists out there. I mean, I could be wrong, but that kind of don't want the wig to be touched by the actor. I mm -hmm. had um, going in for last looks. No, I think I was just resetting something and went in and said to my actress, like, oh my God, I'm loving you touching your hair in this, in that last take. It's great. I think she read it as complete sarcasm. Oh, no. And she freaked <laughs> out and she goes, she was just like, oh, do you not want me to touch it? And I instantly was like, oh, my God, she's got trauma from this. Like somebody's obviously <laughs> at some point being like, don't touch your wig, don't touch your hair. And I was just oh, like, no. no. I was like, lady, I, I love it. Like it's it looks amazing. Like mm -hmm. keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, spell it. But that, that fear hair. on her face that she just really thought I was telling her off in some kind of weird sarcastic yeah way <laughs> I mean you have to you have to encourage them to feel safe to create I mean in the hair trailer the wig the wig the makeup the hair it's kind of the closest thing to their performance a lot of times we're looking at their face watching them perform mm. if that's not aiding their performance I feel like it's our jobs to help the actors also forget that they're in the wig and yeah. they're able to just live in the moment of their performance. We're so lucky to work with such great artists and mm. we need to be able to give them the freedom to perform. Yeah. Yeah. And I should mention too, a wig's only as good as the last person who touched it. So wash your wigs, reset your wigs, love your wigs. <laughs> All this advice that he's passing on. Is everybody listening? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Love That's your wigs, awesome. wash your wigs, and block your wigs properly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good place to start. Yeah. Now, I would like to know what one tool or product you would never want to be without in your working day. My ventilating hook. Oh, you have, yeah, of course. I have the same ventilating hook and holder made out of a beautiful, lightweight. We get our knotting hooks made custom out of different woods, like rare woods. And yeah. they're so lightweight, you know, so you don't have, it's just like tying hair through air. It's amazing. So I have my special hook that Victoria had made for me and gave me many years ago. And I'm never without that. You use the same one for everything? Not for everything, but you have, okay. you get the main... dexterity. Correct. The main needle I use is a one to two, but you get the dexterity to using that needle, you can do one hair, you can do two hairs in a knot, you could do three, mm -hmm. you could do four. And that just comes through, you know, years of tying knots, you're able to minutely adjust your tension between the draw 
in your left hand and the hook in your right hand to do all different knotting techniques with virtually the same needle. So yes, I have one knotting hook and then I have a hook that I use for stitching. That's awesome. Yeah. Fun time. And this this um this wood that you're talking about about sounds very bougie and and fabulous. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> <laughs> it's it the hook is so lightweight and that's what it is when you're tying hair for hours and hours a day any little bit of weight or tension affects you know your hands and how they feel at the end of the day so victoria introduced me to the the wooden knotting hooks and i haven't turned back that's awesome so if that was to go missing rob would freak out yes and i am the worst culprit about setting it down somewhere around the studio <laughs> And then going, everyone stop, where is my knotting hook? (laughs) Of course. Yeah. Now, who would you like to hear on the podcast? Oh, goodness. I'm like, who haven't you talked to yet? (laughs) I would like to hear Alan Dangero on the podcast. Do you think he'd do it? I think he would do it. I'm going to call him and tell him he should do it. (laughs) This is your job. (laughs) This is my job. Immediately getting off of here and telling Alan he has to do Jamie Lee's podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Alan's a great, for those who don't know, Alan is a, a brilliant, brilliant hair designer, did Age of Innocence, you know, Silence of the Lambs, like the list goes on and on. Think about any mm-hmm. iconic movie from the last 30 years. Chances are Mr. Dangero did the hair. That's awesome. Well, I have had a lot of fun speaking with you today, as I do every time I speak with you, but this has been <laughs> so informative because there's so much I had no idea about. So thank you for sharing. It's been so awesome having you. Absolutely, Jamie Lee. Thanks for having me on. For links to see more about our guests, go to our Instagram at The Last Looks Podcast or our website, thelastlookspodcast.com. If you want to keep up with new episodes being released, be sure to subscribe through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, Google Play, YouTube, or any podcast streaming platform. And remember, if you're enjoying the show, share it. The Last Looks Podcast would like to thank Brett Stanley and Sabrina Castro. The song Fun Time by DJ Quads. Thanks for listening. Until next time. That's a wrap, people.